16,000 years ago, Australia's east coast stretched unbroken from Cape York to the southern tip of Tasmania. But the shallow land bridge between Tasmania and the mainland was gradually submerging under rising seas. As the advancing ocean made separation complete, two large outcrops remained above water. There's no record of their Aboriginal names, though tribal groups survived on them for generations to come. But long after their feast fires had cooled, the islands were rediscovered by robust seafarers from the other side of the world. Matthew Flinders lent his name to the eastern island, while the handle of his stoic partner in exploration was given to the surrounding strait. But it was the name of the colonial governor who so keenly sponsored their voyages that finally settled on the storm-tossed island in the west. Sailing north in 1770, Captain Cook first sighted Australia off Victoria's southwest coast, and for 28 years it was assumed that Tasmania, to the south, was simply a continuation of the mainland. What that meant was that all ships plying between England and Sydney had to loop south around Hobart. So when Bass and Flinders circumnavigated Tasmania in 1798, they did far more than just redraw the map. With the discovery of Bass Strait, the journey to and from England was slashed by a week. But though it took time from a long, hard voyage, the shorter journey certainly wasn't a safer one. These days, the waves that crash onto King Island's jagged rocks and reefs are a major tourist attraction and a treasured backdrop to local life. But with its coastline straddling the entrance to Bass Strait, King Island often spelt disaster for 19th century seafarers, particularly when foul weather obscured the sun and stars for days on end. Navigation was next to impossible. In fact, King Island has the dubious distinction of being Australia's shipwreck capital, sealing the fate of more than 70 vessels within a century of its discovery. In the island's museum, remnants of the wrecks abound, but out along the shoreline, tide and time have washed most of the evidence away. For example, all that's left of the Shannon, which ran aground on the northwest coast in 1906, are her rusting boiler and connecting rods, and today they're the only relics of King Island's maritime past remaining above water. But down below, it's a different story. The bad thing about diving here is that it is cold in the water. The good thing is once you get down there, there's heaps to see, lots of marine life and dozens of wrecks dotted around the coast. Let's go have a little look. Fantastic. The water's not as cold as I thought. You should come and try it for yourselves. For those with an appetite for seafood that matches their passion for diving, 
small catches of the island's superb southern rock lobster can be taken with a recreational license free of charge. Back in 1866, when Captain Archibald Curry gave his name to this harbour, it was a safe refuge for seafarers who knew all too well the potentially lethal combination of Bass Strait's mountainous seas and King Island's rugged, rocky coast. Today, the harbour is still a welcome site for the more than 10,000 tourists who come to King Island each year. That's because it's such a pretty place with its fleet of colourful fishing boats, but it's also because of what those boats contain. Most of the specimens that end up in the pots of the island's professional fishermen go straight to Hong Kong, where they each fetch up to a hundred US dollars. But without the cost of export, visitors can claim their portion of the catch at a more affordable price. To the west of the island, at the deep, dark edge of the continental shelf, giant Tasmanian crabs are also raised to the surface. In strictly limited numbers, they too fill an Asian export niche. But a more substantial seaborne contribution to the island's economy comes in the form of huge fronds of bull kelp, ripped from their rocky moorings and tossed ashore by the southern ocean swells. In the southern port town of Grassi, a local artist ingeniously fashions small portions into artefacts, but the island's hundred or so kelpies collect it en masse for more profitable purposes. dried tonne they contribute to the local processing plant, they receive close to $400. And ground into granules and exported as an industrial stabiliser for everything from ice cream to explosives, it earns the island close to $2 million a year. It's a messy business, but even the clouds of kelp dust have a silver lining. Reconstituted into pallets, they make an excellent soil conditioner that's widely used in mainland Australia. But that's not the secret of King Island's own lush pastures. Legend has it that the best of these grasses sprang from seeds of melilot, spilt from torn mattresses washed ashore from disintegrating wrecks. By the 1870s, a certain farmer Giles was collecting melilot and distributing it wherever he rode, and by the turn of the century it had spread across the length and breadth of the island. Today, King Island pastures nurture some of Australia's finest beef and dairy herds. And while most of the meat makes straight for Japan, the island's superb blue, brie and cheddar cheeses are found in restaurants and delicatessens across the globe. Of course, there was a time when 
King Island's hills and valleys were carpeted with native trees and bush. But indiscriminate felling, devastating bushfires and clearing for soldier settlement after both world wars left little trace of the thick and lofty timber Lieutenant Charles Robbins described in 1804. In recent years, the development of national parks and the King Island State Forest have seen native heath and eucalypt returning and remnants of original vegetation still exist, particularly in the islands south and west. This is Yarra Creek Gorge. It's a deep, dense oasis in the midst of the surrounding farmland. It's a magic place with a dense understory of tree ferns and ground ferns, topped with magnificent paper barks and blue gums, and surrounded by musk, pinkberry and blue olive berry. It's cool and quiet. The only sounds you'll hear are the water tumbling over the waterfall, the wind in the trees, and the calls of the birds. Following Yarra Creek Gorge for a couple of kilometres to the east brings you to City of Melbourne Bay, with its formations of pillow lava spectacularly cast when molten lava from long extinct volcanoes met the chilly waters of Bass Strait. The island's southwest reveals a very different kind of forest. In a sandy blow surrounded by hardy coastal bush lie the bleached remains of a once thriving wood. Bent and buffeted by the roaring forties, the forest stood its ground. But it couldn't resist the piling sands carried in the wind, and 7,000 years ago, it was finally smothered by the mounting drifts. Of course, the winds that dropped the sand here in the first place could just as easily blow it away again, and that's exactly what happened. However, the calcium in the seashells that made up the sand left us a legacy. Absorbed by the long departed trees, it mimics their forms in this ghostly biological graveyard. seal rocks, the wind works on the sea as well, pounding it to froth and mist on the glistening serrations of the southwest coast. It's a characteristic King Island scene, but no more so than the long, gently curving beaches that shape the island's northern shores. But when the sea's up, surfing comes into its own. beaches fashion well-shaped waves, Martha Lavinia, across on the east coast, is said to have one of the best shore breaks in the business. For years, the stars of international surfing kept the news to themselves, using King Island as a hidden retreat. But bit by bit, the secrets got out, and now King Island has joined the likes of Easter Island and the Galapagos as one of world surfing's great exotic venues.
Linked in a 30 kilometre chain of sand that stretches halfway down the island's east coast, Lavinia Beach forms the foreshore of Sea Elephant and Lavinia Nature Reserve. At first sight, this large expanse of low-lying heath doesn't seem to harbour any unusual landforms, but appearances can be deceptive. There are just four places on Earth, France, Canada, Fraser Island and here at King Island, where conditions are just right for the formation of what are known as perched lakes. Now, perched lakes, like this one here, are formed when silt builds up over a long period of time and forms a kind of waterproof membrane across the floor of the lake that holds water. And of course the water's replenished every time the rains come. The water's fantastic to drink, wonderful to swim in, if in this case you don't mind having your toes tickled by brown trout. As its name suggests, Sea Elephant River was once home to large breeding colonies of sea elephants. But discovered by Europeans in the early 19th century, they were quickly hunted to extinction for their oil, skins and tusks. Now, free from the threat of encroaching civilization, Sea Elephant River and its hinterland have regained a precious sense of wilderness, providing the island's unique blend of fauna with the secure feeding and breeding grounds it needs to survive and multiply. Just like mainland Australia, King Island today is home to a range of native and exotic plants and animals. Fortunately for the island, two of the most destructive exotic species, the rabbit and the fox, didn't make it here. Rabbits would have devastated the vegetation just as they did on mainland Australia, and foxes would have had a field day with the small mammals and bird life. High on their list of easy pickings would have been the colony of fairy penguins at the southern port town of Grassy. These smallest members of the penguin family come ashore every night and head for their sandy burrows, watched only by a delighted throng of tourists. Grassy also has some man-made spectacles that are worth a look. Not the least of which is its now abandoned shearlight mine. As the base ore of tungsten, shearlite has often been in great demand and in 1990 when the mine finally closed, the houses of the 950 miners and their families were abandoned too. Grassy lives on as an attractive fishing and boating harbour and King Island's only deep water port. Though vacant houses still whisper ghost town, new yachting anchorages, hostels, guest houses and a community arts and crafts centre all testify to its renewal. <laughs> Once a week the uh, supply vessel comes into Grassy Harbour it's a fairly tricky passage and the pilot boat's essential to steer it through the, uh, the narrow gap here. Brings those much needed supplies of groceries and especially the grog and exchanges it for King Island produce, cheese, meat and also kelp. Notwithstanding hints to the contrary, King Island isn't big on towns. In fact, there are only three that could possibly lay claim to that title. With its tourist facilities, club and general store, Grassy is one of them. And halfway up the east coast, Narra Cooper is another. This seaside village provides holiday units, two licensed restaurants and a fish and chip shop. The beaches are excellent too, great fishing and diving. But with over half the population of 1800 or so, curry is definitely the big smoke.
In a 60 by 30 kilometre island, traversed by an excellent combination of sealed and unsealed roads, fuel is an essential item and Curry has the island's only pumps to provide it. Curry also has the only post office, bank, newsagent and baker. But Curry has a lot more to offer than the bare necessities. The bakery has a superb range of pies, including local beef and the piece de resistance local lobster. Clubs and pubs offer sit-down tucker, and if fine dining's on the agenda, the boomerang by the sea offers it, with views to match. But some of the nicest things about curry have more to do with contemplation than consumption. A walk down to the pretty little harbour and out along the jetty is always a pleasant experience, and when the fleet's in you can have a chat with the fishermen. On the way back, you can drop into Carolyn Kinnanmonth's studio and talk about her pottery and the island she visited for a quiet weekend back in 1980. If she's not there, her door will still be open and if some of her fluid and fascinating pots prove irresistible, you just have to check the price and pop your money in the honesty box. You mightn't call curry an artist's colony, but back in town there's other excellent work in progress. Kathy Cooper's inspiration spends much of its time circling watchfully above, but when the raptors alight, Kathy's there to capture their implacable predatory gaze. For Cheryl Kerr, the junction of sea, shore and sky holds a timeless fascination. And for those who've strolled the island's rock-strewn coast, her evocative pastels are immediately and hauntingly familiar. Barry Collis selects an eclectic range of subjects and claims no personal obsession with maritime disaster. With the loss of the Katariki and 400 of its passengers and crew in 1843, it was clear that avoiding King Island could no longer be left to the uncertainties of celestial navigation. But it took another 20 years before a powerful beam finally flashed its warning from the northern tip of the island. Once the impressive and expensive Cape Wickham Lighthouse was up and running, it was confidently expected that King Island would no longer pose a serious threat to shipping. But the logic of placing a single lighthouse on the northern tip of the island was fatally flawed. Cape Otway, on the tip of Victoria's southern coast, also had a light, and because it was only 80 kilometres to the north of Cape Wickham, vessels off course could and did mistake the Wickham light for the Otway light, sail safely to its south and straight onto the coast of King Island. Again, the response was slow, and it wasn't until 1912 that Curry, more or less at the island's centre, was blessed with a rather quaint, prefabricated steel lighthouse. With its completion and the progressive replacement of sail with steam, King Island's fearsome ship-breaking reputation faded. But it wasn't until 1956 that Cape Stokes Light added a final southern link to the island's safety chain of flashing signals. Today, life for the island's small, friendly population proceeds at a measured pace that's distinctly different from both the workaday and holiday atmosphere of the mainland. As a visitor, it's something you notice as soon as you get off the plane. The islanders are helpful and happy to suggest things to do and see, but there's no feeling of a set order of priorities, of things that must be done and must be seen before you go. Without that pressure, you feel free to meander and explore, and there's plenty of ways to do it. Riding a horse or bike lets you really experience the surroundings, but if you want to see the island as a whole, 
There are bus tours and cars or four-wheel drives for hire. But when you reach the end of the road, you can get the blood sugar flowing with some local delicacies, then follow the tracks more or less anywhere your fancy takes you, so long as you observe the normal country courtesies. In a predominantly rural community, it's no surprise to see a wood chopping competition in front of the local hotel. Horse racing too is a normal part of Australian country life, but for an isolated community the size of King Island to support a two-month galloping and pacing season is pretty incredible. Second last right. race at King Stand Island, I've got five bucks riding on this one, let's on see how car. she goes. It all culminates on New Year's Day with the King Island Cup. And with entrance from mainlands north and south, it's a class event. There's a couple more class events in the island's calendar too. Perhaps the most picturesque is the King Island Open Golf Tournament, held in November on the superb ocean front links at Curry. Reminiscent of St Andrews in Scotland, the attraction of the course extends well beyond the island's shores. In March, there's the Imperial 20 Coast to Coast Foot Race, covering the 20 Imperial miles from Narracoopa on the island's east to Curry on the west coast. Some of the best long distance legs in Australia do battle, and the event's so popular that hopeful entrants have to register early to be sure of a start. The March long weekend also sees the running of the Queenscliff to King Island, with 30 to 40 of Australia's top ocean races lining up for the honour of tacking first into Grassy Harbour. Even today, the natural power of wind still plays a central role in the island's life, supplementing the output of its diesel generators and helping to ensure the island remains a clean, green haven for future generations. In fact, propellers of all sorts now provide the lifeline to and from the island that was once the province of sail. They take the lobster fleet in search of the spiny but succulent prize roaming the rocky crevices beneath Bass Strait. Other propellers rapidly dispatch their haul to the crustacean connoisseurs of Asia and return with virtually everything required to stock the shelves of the island's supermarkets. Even the island's heavier imports and exports progress with the turn of a screw, and every inbound and outbound passenger relies on propeller power too. Well, here I am, a reluctant outbound traveller. I found it incredibly easy to relax into King Island's way of life, and I have to say that the thought of the traffic and the crowds waiting for me at the end of this 40-minute flight north across Bass Strait don't really appeal. But that's the way it goes, and I do plan to come back for some more scuba diving. But before we go north, I want to take one last circuit around this 40th parallel paradise that is King Island. <laughs>